I don't know why I have this microphone. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to start off by um, saying a thank you to many people. There's, with actually, there's a real support structure to uh, making these things happen. Um, I think, firstly, um, when we were thinking about um, organising this conversation, you know, we didn't have a, a venue. We didn't have a, really even. Um, a sense of how we wanted to bring it together, but um, we thought it was something that we needed for, not necessarily so much for us actually, but for, for future generations. So my name is Sepak Engiyama, I'm the Artistic Director of INNOVA, which is the, stands for the Institute for International Visual Arts. Um, and I really have felt very emotional over these last days actually, because uh, not only to see um, the work of uh, Sonia Boyce in the pavilion, to see Zeb Sidira as her neighbour in the French pavilion, to see Stan Douglas, who's a lot taller than I thought, thought he was. <laughs> 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 um, to meet Yuki Kahara, I'm just really thankful to be able to bring these people together. And that really has been because of, um, uh, I would say, a kind of family that has sat around um, Innova as an organisation. Um, it, it was kind of built on the idea that there needed to be space for artists whose work was not necessarily being championed um, and to recognise that there are new forms, new ways, new um, other ways of knowing and being, and that maybe an institution needed to be built that didn't necessarily sing the same um, Eurocentric song. So how, um, how do you build an institution like that? So I have to say as well, I'm really thankful to Jelaine Tawardros, who is the founding director, um, and who actually nominated us. <laughs> I think, Jelaine, you're in the room somewhere. Yes. <laughs> um, but nominated Innova to, um, to receive funding from the European Cultural Foundation. And we wouldn't have been able to, yeah, to be here without that nomination. So I, there's a lot of invisible work that happens. And I think, ooh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> You know, I also recognise the work of Wanda. What she's doing is incredible, and she's been so welcoming to us. Um, and yeah, so I'm very, very glad to be among you all today. I'm going to stop crying. They <laughs> 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 can't get me to the but I mean, that's what I found so incredible. There's so much joy in the work of the people that are sitting here. I was really recognizing, you know, the joy in what was being produced and, but also wanting to spend time in those spaces and also to recognize all the forms of struggle and resistance that people are fighting against and with in some, in some cases and recognizing um, that these notions around um, nationhood and nation, um, that uh, they're kind of recognized forms, there are ways in which you're able to exert political will, but also to be able to um, recognize the importance of, you know, sovereignty and, 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 and. So um, I've been trying to, you know, brought up in um, the UK, um, I've been trying to sort of think outside of these um, spaces and, um, and often you look to the work of artists to be able to, to do that. Um, and so I'm, I'm not here supposed to be speaking too much, really I'm here to like just introduce and uh, to, to, to hand the floor over to the artist because um, I just think fundamentally um, this is a space for artists to congregate and gather and to come together. So I'm, I'm just here as a, a backup dancer. <laughs> 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 
So, um, I know there was a lot of dancing last night, I heard all about it. <laughs> um, so, I now do the official, official bit so I don't forget it. But, um, so, Innova, as I said, is the Institute for International Visual Arts, and in partnership with Abaclad, it clears after the storm, raises the question of what is nation with um, artists Sonia Boyce, Sim Sidira, Stan Douglas and Yuki Kahara. Um, this is conversation as part of the Drift, a post-national digital pavilion that troubles the notion of working within the constructions of nation and nationhood. This pavilion um, forms part of the European Pavilion Project, a network of new European arts and cultural organisations that radically reimagine um, nationhood through artistic and um, educational projects. So what is nation? opens up the possibility to think beyond boundaries and borders of land and water, thinking through what is carried in the body to motherlands and other lands, to disperse diasporas, forge post-national identities, ident um, imaginaries, communities, and formations of new fluid subjectivities. We asked the artists presenting in the 59th Venice Biennial, what does it mean to you to represent a nation? Um, so, <laughs> who wants to kick us off? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, Stan, I heard um, that you spoke quite, um, uh, in, I would say actually almost like poetically in a way, about what it meant for you to represent uh, Canada. Um, I would like to ask you, like, um, what, when you were invited, was it clear for you what you needed to do in terms of what work you wanted to show? and? Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about what you've chosen to show here? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I kind of knew it immediately what I wanted to do, uh, based on the fact that uh, it was supposed to be last year, which would have been the 10th anniversary of uh, 2011, which had sort of global um, expressions of um, uh, sort of outrage and dis discomfort and disquiet about what the situation of the world. Um, but also the whole idea of showing in the Giardini, which is uh, it shows evidence of the relics of the uh, sort of colonial nations of the 19th century. It's a very peculiar place, and obviously the hierarchies there are, are quite, quite evident, and the position of Canada within that hierarchy is also uh, quite evident as well. So, by representing the nation of Canada, I wanted to not represent the nation of Canada. Um, I want to sort of like sort of avoid this whole idea of nations altogether because nations are and nations aren't. Nations are fictions which are there to create an identity which is. Uh, um, is useful for certain utility, uh, but often has some very pernicious uh, side effects. Um, surprisingly, but maybe not surprisingly, it originates in the New World, in the settler uh, colonies where uh, people who were from elsewhere wanted to felt they belonged in a place and to uh, have a sort of a tie to that place and, and, a, and a commonality. And it was later exported back to back to the Old World. Um, but you know, being from Canada, where that, that thing, that sort of dynamic is still in play is a very peculiar thing. So I wanted to not deal with um, any kind of fixed notion of identity, territorial identity, uh, but look at the way in which um, we share things as a larger community. Um, in that case, by tying uh, the revolutions of 1848 to a continent-wide um, uh, expression of uh, uh, disquiet and, and distress within, within Europe that led to the nation states which have uh, very serious problems of their own that we see now in Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, but also to tie it to the, um, what happened in 2011 across, across the globe, and, uh, from uh, Tunis to New York to London to Vancouver, which was clear as it was happening when I saw it, um, would not have the same political efficacy as the 1848. It would be something through like a police event and then uh, forgotten about. But I wanted to treat those moments like a, a, a political expression, even if it is a, just a complete uh, uh, expression of political fury or um, you know, fury at the, the conditions under which people are living. Um, so that's in that way I um, wanted to present my nation's uh, position as a one uh, community among a very complex and fluid communities. That is a bit of a downer, but uh, the, the work we're showing in the uh, uh, magazine The Sally is much more optimistic, which shows a collaboration between musicians in uh, the UK, musicians in uh, Cairo, who don't speak the same language, don't have the same, uh, same culture, but through a common musical language derived, no doubt, from the internet, they able to find a way of collaborating and a way of finding joy. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. So Sorry, I think... I to use the hand. I oh, yeah. Can, you, can you hear me now? No. no. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Sorry, it wasn't actually switched on. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to pick up on, I mean, there's a couple of things that uh, actually you can actually see within the works um, of Sonia and, and um, Stan is that is this element of um, sound and how you kind of not only work with sound, but also the importance of music. Um, that's, that's, so that's one element. And I think another element I just wanted to pick up on there, um, especially in your work, um, Zineb was just also thinking about in the, in this mise en abîme that you created within the pavilion, there was this conversation between um, Jelaine and Sonia talking about the various kinds of, um, you know, ruptures across the UK. Um, and actually Stuart Hall always talks about this idea of rupture and settlement. And I just wondered, um, yeah, whether, what was the kind of impetus then or, or the drive, let's say, in the, in the construction of your pavilion? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, from the outset, a bit like Stan, I knew I, knew I would be doing something. Um, you know, I mean, you have to think of, of this idea of nation when you're invited to represent a country. I'm not even sure the word representing is, is you know, correct nowadays, really. But anyway, in my case, I really wanted to transform the, the French pavilion into a film studio. And of course, cinema and film entails for me uh, the idea of magic and trickeries and lies and fiction and reality. So by turning um, the French pavilion into this film studio, I was also, you know, bringing this idea that what does it mean, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, to be French, especially for somebody like me who lives in London, and I have lived in London for 30 years, who is French and who is also Algerian, who oh, is working strong now. Mike, is that okay? Yeah, it's better? Yes. Um, so, yes, uh, and then my project itself and the film I made uh, was very much about friendship and bringing all my artistic community um, and sharing it, sharing that pavilion with them. Uh, and obviously my friends come from all over the world because like uh, all the artists sitting here, we travel a lot, we make friendship, we build friendship all over the world. And uh, so you have friends that comes from, you know, everywhere. But also I looked at, you know, a certain type of cinema um, and that kind of uh, what I call the triangle, the triangle between France, Algeria and Italy. Um, so yes, so, you know, I, I didn't do a project you know, a French project in many ways, whatever that means, but like a project which is in some ways much more um, based in Italy, because the Italian cinema uh, of the period I was researching for me was extremely important and very rich here. Um, so I don't know if I responded to your question, did I? <laughs> um, I was, did you start with the idea of the cinema first? Though? Yeah. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when you uh, nominated, you asked pretty quickly to kind of provide a, a small uh, text on what you'd like to do. And actually, my, you know, I straight away said I wanted to do, um, you know, a reverence or homage to the uh, film festival of Venice, the Mostra, and ending that to Algeria and France. And there is a lot of stories around those three countries and the, and the Mostra. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so, and I quite pretty much stuck to the little kind of text summary that I gave uh, very early on, which was something like February 2020, you know, just before the lockdown. Um, and yes, and then I spent all my time researching, traveling a lot, uh, because this is part of my, uh, the way I work. I researched a lot in the archives, and hence I went to, uh, you know, did a lot of film archives in, in France and Italy. And I happen to have done a lot in Algeria previously. So yes, this is the way it all started. Um. Um, Does this, oh yeah, you can, uh, this is okay. Um, so Sonia, just um, picking up on um, what Zeneb said just about in friendships, and I'm just thinking about uh, the kinds of collaborations that you do, um, the way that you work um, seems as though it has this kind of uh, also a dialogic input, one that is also based on um, networks or uh, collaborations. Um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about these four, is it four characters, four singers or five? There's, well, there's, there's four singers and one composer. Exactly. Um, can you say a little bit about your collaboration with them and why you came to this decision to, to work in this way to represent uh, the UK? Um, 
I've got I've, I've, I've written two pages of stuff here actually <laughs> just by, by what, what you've all been saying and I'm really I'm so pleased to be here and, and what an amazing crowd as well um, uh, can I first start by saying it, my, my my immediate response to what is nation or what does it mean to represent nation I immediately thought who do we imagine constitutes nation and I think that that really is quite critical to, um, to this discussion. Um, with the people that I've been working with, and this, you know, I've been working with a whole range of people over 20, nearly 30 years, um, I, I'm always struck by the way in which the people that I'm working with and the nature of the work that, that happens is not, is not tied to a singular um, set of questions about nation, but is about relations, whether they are local relations that stretch far across the world. You know, and I think that this is really important within the project that I've been doing, where um, uh, the, the uh, composer Erilyn Wallen and the four singers, that is um, Jackie Dankworth, Poppy Ajuda, Tanita Tikaram, and Sophia Jernberg, they all, you know, they've all had careers within the British music scene, but they all have relationships beyond and within this idea of nation. So I think it's, 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 it's really difficult to talk about nationhood in that singular way. And I'm particularly um, interested in the way that sound, for instance, you know, it bleeds, it travels, it's difficult to, to contain the voice and the sound because it's always present with us in some way. So these are the things that I'm kind of working with is to, it's, it always feels really strange to say, okay, you know, and I've been asked quite a lot, you know, how does it feel to represent, you know, the UK in the British Pavilion? And I kind of think, my only answer to that is, I was born in London and I'm an artist. <laughs> but that doesn't contain it all, but in some ways, pragmatically, it says enough for me. Thank you. Um, I just wanted now to turn to Yuki, um, because I think this question of where you live or where you're born or what you carry with you or how you even identify is something that really comes up in your, in your work. Um, but also the introduction of, um, um, let's say, um, how, how do we... Um, recognize um, the voices of people who are often marginalized as well. Um, so, yeah, with that, would you be happy to? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, kia ora tala falava. Thank you, Sipaki, for that question. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge um, Inovat for um, including me in this illustrious panel. Um, uh, and I also would like to uh, say that uh, thank you very much for Wanda for including me. I am uh, representing uh, the pavilion of Aotearoa New Zealand. Maori are the indigenous people of New Zealand. And I would like to acknowledge uh, Rachel Rakana, Brett Graham and Megan Tamati Cornell uh, from the uh, Maori arts community. Uh, these are curators and artists who are at the top of their game. So if you want to know more about Aotearoa art, please go and talk to them. Um, so, uh, I am someone, I basically hijacked the New Zealand Pavilion. Um, and then, um, so uh, but before I start talking about uh, my exhibition, Paradise Camp, curated by Natalie King, um, I first of all need to state that um, uh, my family uh, acknowledges me as a fa'afafine. So, fa'afafine is made up of two compound uh, Samoan words. So, fa'a meaning in the manner of, and fa'afine meaning uh, woman, in the manner of a woman. So, it's a term that's used to describe those uh, who are assigned male at birth, who express their gender in a feminine way. We also have uh, fa'atama, meaning in the manner of a man, which is a term used to describe those who are assigned female at birth, who express their gender um, in a masculine way. And then together with cisgender man, uh, a tama and cisgender woman, Fafine, uh, we make up four genders in our Samoan society. 
um, how, uh, so it's a culturally recognized gender. However, Fa'afafine and Fa'atama are not legally recognized. And the reason why it's not legally recognized is because Samoa uh, was a colony of uh, New Zealand from 1914 to 1962. So on the eve of our independence, the New Zealand government, colonial government, uh, imposed two laws directly targeting the Fafafini community. So the first one was a banning of female impersonation by any male in public, and second one was homosexuality. And I believe that the reason why um, the New Zealand colonial ad administration imposed these laws is because they saw the Fafafini community being um, and being an impediment towards Samoa's progress towards ind uh, independent nation building. Um, and then, so the idea of independence in Samoa is actually heteronormative. Um, so what I wanted to do with my exhibition, Paradise Camp, was to imagine a Fafafide utopia where, um, you know, colonial heteronormativity is shattered to make way for indigenous ways of understanding where um, it, that is uh, more inclusive um, and acknowledges as, uh, you know, uh, sensitive towards the changes uh, in the environment. Um, but beneath the surface of paradise, which is something that is continually perpetuated, um, you know, by many explorers and artists um, and in the tourism industry, is that you know beneath the surface of paradise lies the real life stories, you know, of the Fafafine community working through um, the colonial legacies of gender, sexuality, and the environment, uh, specifically to the social and political context in Samoa. Um, and then so what you see uh, at Paradise Camp um, is, uh, uh, so when you say, you know, what is the nation? I'm representing the nation of Fafafine. Um, <laughs> I'm representing the nation of Fafafine. Um, so, um, and I'm also proud to say that um, uh, the, uh, the Paradise Camp was made with the cast and crew of all Samoans, uh, which, is, uh, which is amazing because, you know, we've, we've never had a production scale of uh, 100 people, 100 Samoans, you know, take, you know, shot on location in Upolu Island. Uh, everybody in Samoa doesn't know what the Venice Biennale is, but when I told them that it's a big international event, there was enough to kind of galvanize everybody's, you know, sort of support towards the project. Some Fafafinis were problematic because they thought I was going to treat them with like red carpet and everything, like being on set. But, um, but um, yeah, um, and. Um, and I was really surprised when the New Zealand government, you know, selected myself, you know, to represent, you know, the Aotearoa New Zealand because, you know, like, you know, I'm, you know, Fafafine, Samoan and Japanese, and it's a triple threat to middle class white people, you know, in Aotearoa. <laughs> but um, I'm really, um, you know, I'm honored to be, uh, you know, representing the Fafafine community. And, then, you know, I was really elated, you know, when the New Zealand government gave me all this money, I could give it to all the Fafafines. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, it's great to be hijacking and you know giving a bit of a payback. <laughs> Thank you for this. I didn't realize the nation of Fafafina. Can I join? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to come back um, to this idea of the, the mise en beam for a moment. Um, because um, I've been thinking about these narratives held within narratives or nations held within nations. Um, and this is, um, but also about. Uh, trickery or or even maybe not necessarily trickery but the trickster um and so how are narratives um permeated how are they constructed um i have to say stan when i look at your phot photographs i feel a little bit unnerved i don't know if other people have that feeling and i think it's because um as a photograph i often um, there is this kind of truth telling that I think that it should be telling me a true narrative but um, there is always something quite unnerving unsettling and um, um, I don't know something that creates a little bit of a jarring 
So I think, uh, I ha then I immediately question whether this narrative is true. Um, although the medium tells me, or at least I believe the medium tells me and the, the way they're constructed tells me that there is, there is some truth telling there. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the series that you've included in the pavilion here? Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I'd just say that the, the best way to tell the truth sometimes is to lie. And um, so by creating fictions in, in these pictures, I'm able to uh, con condense something that's otherwise quite um, amorphous or, or dispersed um, over time or space, but it can be seen in one place uh, in, in these pictures. And so I, I totally take responsibility as these being um, constructions, my constructions for which I take responsibility, as opposed to saying this is somehow an indexical capture of reality and it just happened to be the way it was. No, it was actually, it, it was built the way it was to present a scene um, in, in a way in which these things which are otherwise fleeting can be sort of uh, held together in one, one, one place. Uh, the uncanniness you may feel could be due to the fact that there's too much going on, too much information, too much detail, which isn't peculiar to normal photographs. Uh, and this is the way of calling, to, um, calling to attention the, uh, the artificiality of the situation, and in which we're not seeing a snapshot of life, we're seeing actually a schematic uh, of, of an event in, in, in these places, which are sometimes based on documented material, as in the case of the Hackney picture, which is both uh, uh, aerial photography from, by license from Sky News, plus a photograph I took of the, the location, or constructions, where the backgrounds are sometimes constructed, the, the, uh, and the foregr foregrounds for the other three pictures are performers uh, in a hockey arena who were you know, shot by me um, over, over time. Um, but yeah, the truth is flexible these days. We, couldn't, we haven't believed in photography for at least a century, um, or since it, since it originated. Uh, and um, anybody who would like to tell us that we, sh we should um, is sort of mistaken. And I just want to play with that uh, in-between space. Um, Zinab, you also kind of talk about trickery in, in the beginning of your film. Um, and I wondered uh, about this, the stories and the narratives that you're telling, or the trickery that's within the stories and the narratives that you're telling. Could you tell us a little bit more about the, the film that you made and, and this idea? Well, um, yes, yeah, so it's a film about uh, films, it's a film about filmmakers. Um, and I kind of researched uh, a lot, um, you know, the, the, the strategies used in, in cinematography or in cinema making, filmmaking, um, and all that, you know, in acting and behind the scenes and, you know, set design and, and all those things. And I, um, yeah, I actually literally enjoyed myself playing roles, many roles because I'm acting a lot uh, in my film. Um, and uh, yes, you know, uh, fiction and, and, and lying and, and creating stories, new stories, and mise en abyme, it's, for me, was one way, actually, to talk about my personal experience of growing up in France and living in England subsequently, but also about politics. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, uh, politics. And... Um, because, you know, like uh, Stan was saying, it's sometimes it's better to lie than to actually. And also, what does lie mean? You know, what does reality for each of us? It's a, it's a very different reality, a different life. But yes, yeah, so the film starts with a brilliant quote from Orson Welles, from his film F for Fake, where he says this is a film about trickery. But then he goes on to say, um, most of films are about lies, but not this one. <laughs> which is for me like a, just a brilliant kind of quote from him. Um, so yeah, I've based pretty much my film around his film, F for Fake, although his was about, you know, um, fakery in the art and in paintings, but I'm, like, I'm talking about magics and trickeries and fiction in cinema. And the whole film is based on, yeah, as you know, for people who've seen on me playing different roles uh, and also including friends playing roles and then there are moments who are not lies. You know, for example, the scene you mentioned earlier, Gillian, Sonia, and I discussing in my living room politics, Brixton politics, or London politics. This is a reality. But then it's displaced in a, in a, in, in a mise en abyme session because you see them in my living room chatting and they film them. And then you have the TV, the screen, literally in the same living room uh, exhibited. So as you're sitting in the living room now in the French pavilion, you can hear Sonia and Gillian and I chatting. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, yeah, what, what can I say? For me, it was the kind of the, the strategy, the best strategy to talk about politics and to talk about my life without taking myself too seriously because it's always quite unnerving when you use yourself so much 
as a person. So um, there is a lot of self-derision also, you know, self-deprecation, -de you know, and a lot of uh, comedy in the film and all those tools, which is the mise en abyme, the behind the scene, the making ofs, the readaptation, the remix of some scenes, all that for me allowed me very strongly and the, the writing and the saying and the recording of the voiceover, all that really allowed me, I think, to talk about politics in a way that, and, and especially talks about French politics somehow, you know, in that French pavilion, but all that with a lot of question mark whether am I telling the truth or not all, all the time, yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit more about the the character that you perform that um, dances? But we also see a kind of reproduction, almost. Well, I saw it as a reproduction of yourself in the pavilion being performed. So there was this you performing and this wonderful movements that you make. Uh, your hair is like beautifully dressed, yeah. and I was wondering about this reenactment that you do sometimes of famous uh, actors or, you know, when you, when this, uh, this aspiration. Yeah. I mean, yeah, to be honest, um, it was a very enjoyable project because I, I, I fulfilled quite a few dreams and my pavilion is called Dreams Have No Titles. But, um, you know, you see me singing as a backing vocals in one scene, which I'm not a singer at all. You see me dancing tango, which I'm not very good at doing. I'm acting a lot and I'm dressing up and, you know, properly acting. And other time I'm just myself, you know, you see other scenes when it's just me dancing at a party or whatever. So, uh, but the, yeah, the scene you're talking about, the ball scene comes from, it's a remake. Uh, my film is very much about remakes of films from the 60s and 70s. And uh, that scene is from uh, Balando, Balando from Ettore Escola. Uh, and I picked up the scene <laughs> where the actress, the original actress looks very much, oh, I look very much like her. And uh, I invited my friend Fessal uh, to also um, be my, my, my tango partner. So there is a lot of kind of irony, uh, but I must say that all those remakes come from films that were made and were seen as anti-militant films or anti-colonial films. And, and at the time we used to call them the tiers of all world films or cinema. Now we wouldn't use this term, but they were like anti-colonial uh, films that were made uh, with all the time with Algeria as a co-producer or as a producer of those films. So I picked up a few scenes of many films. I can cite uh, The Battle of Alger, I can cite L'Etranger de Visconti, uh, The Battle of Alger uh, of um, Gino Potoncorvo, etc., etc. There are quite few films. And, uh, and I enjoy making them. And uh, more importantly, I enjoy having my friends and my curators, for example, all of them are playing some scenes also. Um, so it's a, it's a big party, you know, literally this film, I think. Thank you. Um, Sonia, I just wanted to pick up on this idea of characterization, because I think that's something that plays within um, uh, the pavilion, the British pavilion. Um, we're introduced to these characters at the beginning of this, the space as we enter, um, and we notice there's a marked difference in the kind of coloration of each of the films. So I just wondered if you could speak to that in terms of, um, yeah, what you may be referencing or speaking to there. Thank you. Um, oh, I've, got, I've now got about five pages that I'm writing down. Um, so the, uh, I'm going to come round. I'm going to do a, a bit of a, a loop. One of the things that I think really connects all, all four of us is this use of not only photography, but the question of the document as evidence. Yes, this happened. Um, yes, we have a witness somehow. And I think that that, is, that just follows through for me on, on, on all for our projects and I think that this is really important because we are uh, one of the things that I was thinking about in relation uh, to your to your show Zineb was the, you know what is it what does it mean to stage and to restage and to say and to insist on the presence of a story that sits there almost like a ghost almost like, and that's why we use the, that's why we use these do, these these means that says Yes, in front of this, we are saying this has happened. We are reimagining what happened, but from the evidence of it. And I just think that this is a, maybe we need to really um, speak about the magic that we then do with the evidence. You know, because I think that that is also what is happening here. 
Um, sorry, I'm, I, and so I'm going on a really long, long, um, long route to your question. Um, in terms of the, the coloration of the, the films of the performers that are in my film, um, I'm, I'm making very specific reference to uh, a small project that Adrian Piper did. Uh, she did a, a, a book uh, with Bookworks, which is an artist, uh, artist-run um, publisher based in London called Coloured People, in which she takes photographs or reuses photographs. I think there are people that she knows, and they're black and white photographs, and then she draws on top of them a coloured um, with a crayon. And this book is it's very simple, actually, what she does. But she, in a way, what she's talking about is the way in which uh, the person has been coloured in or coloured by. Um, and for me, I've been you know, trying to think through this question of um, the way in which the physiognomy of the subjects that I'm working with is framed by, the, by, a, wider, by a wider frame and how to figure out how do they come through, they themselves, what they do, in and beyond the way in which they've been coloured. So that's, that's where I'm kind of trying to think about uh, the question, not only of characterization but framing. What is it that frames us? Oh, thank you for that. I mean, I think um, just in terms of thinking about this notion of the evidence, I was also really struck by this sentence of, um, I lose myself in the silence of archives. And so thinking about what is, you know, how does the archive work as a way of, um, uh, of maybe activating through its kind of fragments, a space between and which you can work from. Um, Stan, I'm going to come to you back to you in a minute because I'm going to talk about this in terms of reconstructions. Um, but I wanted first to go maybe to Yuki just in terms of this idea of the framing. Because obviously within um, your exhibition there are um, this uh, media and material that you use. Um, there's uh, photographs that you construct. There's also this um, I have to say, quite a humorous conversation that's um, kind of looking at the Paul Gauguin um, painting. And um, and there, there was something I meant to ask you about but uh, while I was there, but I forgot. There's also this kind of reconstructed uh, face, and I wanted to, to know a little bit about, about this because I didn't actually have a chance to talk to you about it. Could you tell us a bit more? Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so in the Paradise Camp exhibition, there is a single channel video uh, that features like uh, a variety of Fafafini worldview. Uh, one of them is called uh, First Impressions Paul Gugan, which brought together my Fafafini friends um, who really don't really care for uh, Western fine art, uh, where, uh, you know, I kind of set it up like a talk show um, so that uh, they can uh, be presented reproduction paintings of Paul Gugan and they would actually give their own uh, first impression of it. Uh, and the great thing about it is, is that because they don't know nothing about Paul Gauguin, their impression hasn't been poisoned by Western art history. Um, so when they actually look at these paintings, uh, you know, they just start giving their first impression. But the thing is, is it doesn't actually become about Gauguin, it actually becomes about themselves. Um, and um, so that's uh, first impressions of Paul Gauguin. And then so there's the, another uh, video work where uh, I scripted and directed where um, I am in conversation with Paul Gauguin. So I went through four hours uh, of prosthetic transformation to become uh, Paul Gauguin, where um, Yuki and Gauguin has a conversation and Yuki starts interrogating Paul Gauguin. Um, but Paul Gauguin is actually really me. Um, and it's all scripted. Um, and then, um, so, uh, so yeah, so it, I mean, this is all sort of based on, the script is actually based on archival evidence of what Gugan uh, has written. Um, so how Gugan responds to me or how I question him is based on um, uh, all the English uh, translation of his letters um, and all his uh, you know, led us to Van Gogh and all these kinds of things, and it's sort of all kind of scripted around that. So, um, 
I mean, of course, it, it's paraphrased, you know, so that um, it kind of fits in the, the narrative of what I'm doing, but uh, it actually draws on the, ev the archival evidence of actually what he said. Um, and then so the archive is a, is a very uh, strong component in Paradise Camp, but I actually call it archive. So I actually put V, uh, I spelled the archive as like capital V, followed by Macron on the A, an archive. So I actually add the Samoan concept of the VAR into the archive. Um, so the, the Samoan concept of VAR uh, is a space in between. Uh, it's not a space that separates, but it is a, it's a space that uh, brings two entities together uh, into a space that where they can uh, be negotiated. And then so in my archive, I not only draw archives from like, you know, uh, academic institutions, but from my own personal uh, paraphernalia, uh, family records, uh, you know, posters from, you know, Fafafina beauty pageants and all of that. Uh, it's, it's to help to set up the argument to, to like, why I'm actually doing it. Um, and then sometimes you actually need archive to actually anchor um, the argument or people's thoughts because sometimes, because, you know, nobody knows what Fafafina is, so you really need the archives. Well, I need the, the archives to actually... Um, kind of push my argument forward to actually validate the argument and to also validate our own existence. Um, so, you know, it functions in very different ways. Um, thanks for that, Yuki. I'm just thinking about, um, yeah, this notion of validation, but also this truth-telling or lie-telling at the same time, because I guess the archive is also questionable as a space um, and also because, it, of course, it, it will contain fragments. It, it holds some narratives, um, but it obviously cannot contain everything. Um, so, Stan, the reason I wanted to come back to you is that I um, understood that um, in terms of the kind of, let's say, the, the construction of some of the images, there's also the use of actors or um, you also use archival um, information to reconstruct these images. Um, but I wanted to understand about the direction, like do you give them the direction to the actors or the people that are involved within your images? Um, you know, what, what are you using to kind of direct them in terms of, um, is it really about just reproducing an image or is there, is there more that you're at play? <clears throat> Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I don't use actors typically. I use uh, extras because actors often look like actors and uh, extras look like anybody. And so you just have like the, the range of like uh, backgrounds and ages. Um, so typically I, I don't want them to act since they're not actors, um, but to give them a task and something to do and something they're, they're doing with each other. And when I see them do that, really just they're behaving the way they behave and that, that has a more immediacy to it. But just to know the archive, I've been using archives extensively for many, many years. And um, it really is, for me, a way of understanding uh, a time or a situation to get to a point where I can be intuitive about my, my choices, so I don't have to like, sort of think, well, what would this person have done in this situation? I kind of know what that would be based on my familiarity with what I see in the archive. However, in the archives, you all often encounter certain biases in how they're organized, um, certain supposedly objective uh, criteria organized in material, which means it's very difficult to find what you're really looking for. And you've got to sort of work beside that, that, that situation to find out if you know about a certain uh, event in a certain place and a certain maybe personality, then you can find what you're looking for because the criteria are often based on really kind of archaic uh, notions of um, objectivity, which are um, quite, quite terrible. But in, in that, that, that being said, there's still this wealth of uh, information there that really um, needs to be revised and reconsidered in many ways. I really love this idea of working beside. It's like, I think in terms of just also um, this element of where the main action might be taking place, but something that's always happening beside. Um, so I'm going to give the floor, if it's okay, the option to ask a question. Uh, unless you have questions maybe for each... For, oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, sh should I use this mic to pass around, or could you, people could, oh, we don't, oh, we do not allow questions from the floor, I'm sorry, oh, sorry, I, I forgot about this. <laughs> okay, oh, so I, okay, so, um, I, <laughs> Uh, That's right. Yeah. 
I mean, there is, there's, there's always more, but I just, I, generosity is returned back to me. Thank you. Um, so, so I think maybe just in terms of then, just some things I wanted to maybe pick up on, um, because we haven't really talked about music yet or sound. So um, uh, maybe Sonia, I would probably start with you in this sense, because there's obviously this uh, chorus or... I mean, well, it's not more, it's more than a chorus. It's almost, I mean, it's kind of orchestrated with these multiple sounds. And sometimes, I mean, I was describing it like a sound bath. If you stood in one space, you could also hear the sounds from different spaces. Um, so it's a really beautiful orchestration. So I just wondered, um, yeah, just if you could just tell us a little bit more about the sound, the elements in which you were kind of bringing together. Sure. So, um... So the, the work, uh, Feeling Her Way, consists of, uh, as I said before, four singers and one, um, one uh, composer. Uh, and just to explain a little bit about what takes, took, takes place, uh, we uh, managed to gather together uh, these uh, incredible, um, highly, I mean, insanely skilled um, performers. Um, First by Zoom about uh, ten or so days before uh, before the filming, um, and then uh, we all met on the same day, except for one person, but I'll talk about in a second, um, at Abbey Road Studios. Now, all of my all of my projects, um, particularly of the last well, at least twenty years, where I bring people together, I don't direct. I don't. I, I say to people, okay, we've got this space, we've got this time, we're here for this amount of time, what do you want to do? Um, I'm really interested in you improvising, I'm really interested in, um, yes, us not having a script. Um, and I think the, the, the three singers that, um, that came to Abbey Road Studios had never improvised before, um, they didn't know each other, and I'm really interested in what happens when we come together in a space where we're... Where the rules, we kind of know the rules, but the rules are somehow a bit loose and how we then negotiate our differences. So what you, you people will see in the first four films is um, the first half hour where we'd arrived, people had arrived, and the first, the first few minutes when we were in a big crew, lots of cameras, lots of people sitting in the back had been involved in um, bringing this all together. And the four performers, um, Erilyn, Jackie, uh, Poppy, and Tanita, are kind of looking at each other like, oh my God, what are we supposed to do now? And um, Erilyn had specifically said that she wanted to come in to kind of almost draw, draw these voices out in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, um, in an improvised, in an intuitive way. So this is what you see. Um, Unfortunately, Sophia Jernberg, who is, um, who, who uh, she's based in, or she's from uh, Stockholm in Sweden, couldn't travel because of COVID, and so we had to do a separate uh, morning with, 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 with uh, Sophia in Stockholm, and that footage was kind of relayed to us later that day. So it, in all in all, it's a day and a half that we're experiencing um, in terms of time. Um, and then the, once, once all this material, once whatever happens, happens and it's recorded, that's when I, that's when I go and I play. And so one of the things that was really important for me when, once we visited the site in August last year, was to think about how people, how visitors can move through the space, how, um, how to keep the space bright with daylight, so that people could move freely around, not worrying. You know, when you go when you go into um, kind of projected spaces, you can immediately have a kind of anxiety. I think there's enough anxiety to a certain extent in the show because when you enter, you don't quite know what's going on. You hear these different voices. You don't know where they're coming from. Uh, each time you go in, it's a slightly different configuration. But I'm I'm wanting I'm wanting that happenstance to kind of be. Uh, what it is, and basically I ask them to be themselves. Uh, and for me, um, particularly, I mean, there's just some extraordinary 
performances that this is them themselves um, and we can hear them and we can see them and hopefully we can en enjoy that uh, kind of sonic world that they are creating. Um, but in terms of the, the lyrics, the composer was the one who kind of then directed, like, it, like as when you enter, I heard, like, you know, I, I'm not going to sing, actually. Uh, sorry. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, um, yeah, you hear, like, I am queen. And so, the, and, the, and it really, like, the way that um, it's sung, um, it feels like the more it's being sung, the more it's being it's heard by the body, by the singers themselves. You know, they're, they're also taking that, that phrase in. Um, so I just, yeah, so in terms of actually that orality, was that composed? Was that no, no, uh, the, the, the only, there were, there were two, there were two, uh, two of the films where those performers, uh, they filmed, uh, well, initially as solos, um, came with a, a prepared thing. And, and Tanita Tikram, who's, who's, who's playing the piano, she, she had come with something prepared. But actually, um, there was a Steinway piano in the studios. Of course, there would be in Abbey Road Studios. And uh, she said, oh, do you mind if I just play with this? And she invented on the spot five songs, just like that. And that's what that film is. So, and Sophia Jernberg, she's, she, you know, she is an experimental vocalist who was the only one who actually inhabits the world of improvisation as her, as her way of performing, of being. And there are sounds that she made. And actually, uh, note yourself, the next time I show this, I have to get a subwoofer because there's a sound that she makes that hits my st the bottom of my stomach. That I think, where, where, what, how, what, what's going on? She, she literally, she is working with all the elements of her body in order to create the sounds. That she, but what also is really important is that she's doing this non-linguistically. And she's doing this in a way that really disrupts in many ways our understanding of women singing. Um, so if you can hold the mic for a while, because I want to continue this conversation around sound and how you edited and worked with sound within your work. Um, because obviously there's not only the voiceover that you make and you use within the film, but it also is used within the space itself. Um, that it almost becomes, in a way, either... Sometimes it felt like um, di uh, directional, because at one point you mentioned about dancing. I was looking at something else in another space, and I turned around, and the couple were dancing. So I wasn't sure about what that, uh, this orchestration or this kind of editing that you, you, your process yeah. was. Um, I mean, not unlike uh, Sonia, I think my, my use of music is more like accessories, really. Um, it's, um, yeah, you know, it's um, songs and music that's used... Um, in a party scene, for example, and then in the scene of Le Ball that we mentioned earlier, uh, the tango scene. And uh, so it's more kind of uh, something that I wanted to have in my film because I'm somebody who loves music and who loves dancing. So because I love dancing so much, obviously music is very much part of my everyday life. You know, I've got a big collection of vinyls, you know, it's something that I, I you know, I collect and I love and cherish. But it is accessory. I mean, it is like there because it's there, because the scene that I'm shooting calls for that sound. The voiceover, whoop, the voiceover was very interesting because um, I had to write. I mean, I'm somebody with like uh, Sonia. I don't script. You know, I don't. It's quite intuitively that I create my my scenes and my films. But at one point, there was so many different things going on in my film in terms of the aesthetic and, and the difference and the topics of each scene that I needed to create a thread. And that voiceover became the thread and the, and, and the scripted thread. And that was a big struggle for me to have to script and write a text um, that will actually combine, collect all those scenes together. And I think it kind of works. And then I wanted something else to happen. And by the way, the, the, the idea of the voiceover also comes from this uh, uh, 1960s, 70s aesthetic of militant cinema where there was always, you know, voiceover. 
90% of the time by, by men. So, you know, I wanted to kind of uh, disturb that by having my own voiceover speaking in English with a very strong accent, as you can hear. So I wanted to play along also with my accent in some ways in that kind of French pavilion. Um, but yes, also this idea of bringing the sound or the voiceover into the, the other room. So you might be standing in one room and suddenly, and that voiceover that appears in the room is connected to the film which is shown in the cinema. It's exactly at the same time, but we edited and chosen bits of sounds or voiceover that will, you know, come along in, um, in the rooms. Apart from the middle room, the main, the larger room, which is the ball, uh, the ball room, the bar room, um, where there is const constantly, consistently, uh, the tango, jalousy, playing, you know, so people can dance, I mean, because you have a dance floor, so the idea is also to invite people to participate, to sit in the living room if they want to, um, or to dance, or to sit, or to, uh, you know, this is really the idea. You can actually, you can dance, you can dance in your pavilion. Yeah, you can dance in my pavilion, people are too shy to do so, but you can dance in my pavilion, you know, because <laughs> please, if you haven't come yet, please, please use the dance floor. Um, and, you know, it doesn't matter if you can't dance tango, but <laughs> any dance is uh, accepted. Okay, we're gonna um, be sort of wrapping up in the next five minutes, and I, I just um, was just sort of reflecting now on, on many of the experiences over the last couple of days, but also in your conversation. Um, I feel like I'm among tricksters. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, movers and shakers, um, but at the same time, um, I sort of recognize that there's also a kind of um, awakening or a navigation through um, different kinds of um, material, whether that's archival material, whether that's sonic material, but also um, collaborations. I mean, I think all of you um, in your work have involved, whether it's the team around you, um, you've all been working in a kind of collaborative way. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you, Stan, about how did it come that you, this young artist that you were working with um, to produce your film, which is not very far away actually from here. <clears throat> which is not very far from here, so after you finish you should go and see it, it's not far. Um, but, but <laughs> But I just wanted to, yeah, to get a sense of, like, how did this collaboration come about? Yeah, and uh, as a note, uh, dancing is allowed in my pavilion as well. Um, <laughs> it, it is dance music after all, but, uh, um, yeah, we tried to make contact with people involved in the, in the genres, and um, uh, the grime royalty of the UK was not really interested in, in talking to me, so... Uh, but my, my musical director, uh, luckily, you know, was a producer. He knows people in, in, in that scene, as well as uh, UK rap. And he recommended some people he worked with, and so looked at their videos, and then I got in touch and first asked uh, Tremendous, the lady with the, um, the dreadlocks, and she invited her friend Sanity to, to collaborate. A uh, bit more chaotic on, on the uh, Cairo side, there were some connections, we had some people lined up, they pulled out the last minute, but we had some backups, and they came in, pressed some recommendations, and just when we got, we landed there, and uh, I guess the, I, we were, I was going to delay, but my producer said, no, don't delay, we got a window. And Omicron was gonna would have ruined it if we did delay. So we, we but we we got, we got it done uh, in, in effect. So it was a networks of people who knew people who knew people, and in a, in a just in a very, in a very general way, I give them uh, uh, instructions as to what the thematic should be about, about the politics of everyday life, and then let the, let them do what they do. But then my challenge was how do I organize the material? Um, so it was very. I mean, that had took me three goes at uh, uh, making an edit and a way of sort of. De developing the, the temporal material into something that could programmatically be reorganized in, into uh, new sequences, which was really a big thing to get my head around, but it, it took a while. But in, in the end, I think it is a musical structure, and in general, just to refer to what we were saying earlier, um, at base, music is a way, a model of the way in which people share time together. Uh, if it's a, a solo speaking to the absent other, if, if, it's, a, if it's a duet uh, in collaboration, is there harmony, is there dissonance? All these models are the way in which uh, uh, people speak together. And in ISDN, we kind of add the uh, feature of telecommunications being an instrument which uh, talks about remote connection over uh, space and time. Um, yeah, I just wanted you to, in terms of your collaborations as well, it would be really great to hear about 
what is the nature of the collaborations? How did they come, how did they come together? Thank you. Um, so uh, just continue on with the conversation about the music that we're having. Um, so the primary audience for Paradise Camp is the Fafafina community. So that's the audience that I want to empower. So therefore, I wanted to actually play with musical cues that Samoans or Fafafina community were already familiar with. Um, so those were, um, you know, church or orchestral music um, and, you know, some of the traditional music that we were familiar with. Um, and then so I catered the sound so that would appeal to the Samoan audience because Paradise Camp will uh, eventually tour back to Samoa in, in later 2023. Um, so uh, when I create the sound and the music, I first think about my audience and the audience they want to empower. So that was the Samoan community and specifically the Fafafini community. So I kind of evolved everything around what they are familiar with and what they will be comfortable with, um, you, know, in, in, you know, to open up their hearts so that I can actually, you know, uh, insert some of my views around, you know, about the world, about the world of Paradise Camp. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're coming to the last comments. I can see that Sonia's writing. <laughs> She's writing. Yeah. So I'm going to, for the fi final comments, I'm just going to pass the microphone this way and then I'm, I just got some acknowledgements to do. Um, are, are you wanting me to talk about uh, how I get people on board? Yeah. Um, Sorry, every time you ask me a question, I go slightly somewhere else to come back to me. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, so I would, I, part of me was just trying to, again, think about all four of us and the question of world building and world imagining and world um, playing with our worlds um, that I think is, um, is not always assigned to us as, as, as artists that we, that's what we are. That is actually our job is to build imagined worlds. Um, so the way in which the, the way in which um, I collaborate, and there, are, I mean, there really are huge amounts of people who 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 contribute to, uh, particularly to this show, but many of the works that I do. And some some projects take quite a long time, and some are very kind of quick. Um, and so I, I have, uh, you could say, I have three levels of of people that I, uh, or stages. Uh, so I have contributors who I, I think really shape the work. Um, there are participants who I feel um, are, are come and be part of it as witnesses. And of course, then there is, well, actually, then there's maybe four because the, the, there's the teams that are involved to get all of these things. And so there are different roles for different, you could say, um, uh, spaces of collaboration, um, but the the, the, main, the main reason why I collaborate, sorry, I'm being really unfocused now, um, is because I am deeply interested in how how do we negotiate difference internally and externally? What are the anxieties we have? How does that shape what we what the work becomes? Um, how and and it's difficult when you're when you're talking about collaboration because always the question of um, Whose work is this? Who's the author? Who owns this work? Who is, uh, when people come into the work, the negotiating of um, the ego in terms of, um, you know, for some, and I've done lots of work in this field for a long time, uh, to be part of a group, particularly as an artist, you, it's, it's imagined that somehow one might lose a bit of one's identity, get lost in the crowd, but actually, this is where the dynamic and the spark and the magic for me happens. And yes, it involves the, anxi the anxiety as well as the ecstasy of when people come together. Um, but I do try to be very clear with people that I'm working with and I tend to have a contract with them all about, you know, hoping that they have trust in me, that I'm not going to do something detrimental with how they contribute with me, that they, they give me then license to go run play with, um, but it is very complex. It's not something you can. It sounds. It sounds really wonderful. Oh, collaborating sounds quite light, but actually, it's very, very complex. And one's dealing with 
many different emotions and drives and who's doing what for what reason and people then trying to figure out how to work together and then what comes out of that. But I am deeply, deeply, deeply invested in this idea that there is a space in which we can do magic. But um, Sonia, but don't you think though that, you know, by I mean, stealing Tino Segal's words, con constructing a situation that, you know, you're actually inviting them, you know, uh, you know, upon the agreement that these are the parameters, this is how you engage, and I'm the one that's leading the project. So you're actually constructing a situation uh, to which um, everything just kind of peripherates from there. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> my collaboration for this project was very different and very complex because obviously I collaborated with friends who were acting and who are, you know, who are in the films. And then also the crew I worked with, the technician are in the film because I'm, I've shot some um, behind the scenes and now some making of. So the, the team, which is usually invisible, you know, the film crew, which is usually invisible in, in filmmaking, really, or in showing the film, are very, very much present. So that was a new kind of a type of collaboration for me. But the most complex one, which I was trying to, to do, it's the collaboration or the kind of the communication with all the right orders of the films and the music. And uh, that was an interesting one because I discovered a lot of things. And I discovered also that some right orders of some films that I was trying to um, give homage to didn't want to play the same game. Some played it very well. It was fantastic. And it was, uh, yeah, it was very powerful. Um, but the one you expected to be actually quite open to a conversation, to open to the type of conversation I wanted to bring into the pavilion we're not playing the game. So that was, an, but when it did work, I very much saw it as a collaboration because I sent them clips of the films, of the remakes, we had discussions. And um, so it was a kind of new type of uh, uh, collaboration and a very, very complex one um, that, uh, <clears throat> yeah, anyway, I'm not, <laughs> not gonna say much more to that. But um, so yeah, f I don't usually work with other artists. I include, people in my films, like through interviews, and um, people know that about me. It's often the family, the mother, the father, the daughters, the son, <laughs> the family, the whole family. Um, but yeah, this one was, uh, was, um, yeah, was kind of very enjoyable, just because everyone, everyone was part of the work. Everyone is, and when you enter the French pavilion, you will see on the floor some kind of a tape, because when you, film a, a scene, you mark on the floor where you have to stand, for example, and I, want, and I marked every single bit, places we were in with the name of the person that actually um, either shot the film or was in the film. So, um, so the, the presence of, this, um, of the crew and my actors, my friends, is very much um, part of the film. No, no, I mean, I think, um, yeah, for me, it was just it, what you've all described is, is the recognition that your practices are part of community, they're part of dialogue, they're part of collaboration. Um, and I, I noticed also this long line of people who, you, you know, included their names on the wall. And, and I think it's, um, yeah, I think I also may need to make some acknowledgements to the Innova team um, who have come to support and have been working hard to pull this together. Um, the producer and I, um, Sarera, um, Herre Sar Sar Saravea Herrera, um, Beatrice Lover, the um, curator, um, on my right, these wonderful people here, um, our archivist, um, Caroline Coronteng, um, Toby Faladay is our curatorial assistant. It's been incredible to have um, you all here. And um, it's, I have to say again, um, not only to Wanda, but also to the artists, thank you. Yes. Um, I just want to say one thing. I just want to thank uh, Zineb Sidera and Sonia Boyce uh, for offering your support letters. When my government, uh, New Zealand government, nearly pulled a plug on our pavilion because of the COVID uh, pandemic, and then you guys came to the rescue and offered your strong support letters for Paradise Not to Happen. So, thank you.
Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to enjoying your work more. And I think it's time for Wanda to take the mic. Can we all meet in an hour in my pavilion and have a good dance, please? Uh, so, um, I took the liberty of ordering lunch for 150 people, and it's on us, um, and it will be in the courtyard out here, um, drinks and lunch, so please, this is where you can ask questions and have conversation and, you know, all those good things. And we're back in here at 3 p.m. with another group of artists, and then also um, till 5, and then this evening at 7, we have our opening party, and it's just around the corner at the conservatory. But if you go to Abaquad, A-A-B-A-A-K-W-A-D.com, normally we would have the slide up there, but he can't seem to put it up right now. Um, all the schedules there, all the venues are there, and it's pretty easy to find, and we're here all weekend. So thank you so much. And thank you all so much. You've earned your lunch, baby, and some wine.